uh, with the objective that you know i want to describe the language model uh, and make uh, you know all the people to understand uh, the participants understand that how this language model has evolved uh, from statistical to the to the current uh, neural models and as you know that the field is rapidly uh, sort of changing so by no means it would be a, a very exhaustive uh, uh, description or discussion however i feel that once you understand these you know the how this language model has evolved uh, any new models will be easy for you to pick up and i think i hope that that will make it faster uh, you know a way to understand the different models so i will begin my talk with uh, giving a very formal definition of uh, what do we mean by language model uh, it may not exactly or you know strictly be uh, in a same fashion all the models follow but still more or less under that framework you can put all the language model and then subsequently i move to the different models which actually try to capture uh, this language model uh, starting from the statistical language model and then moving forward to the different you can say the generations of the neural language model okay so that's the uh, the plan for uh, today's talk so before moving to the you know uh, defining or saying that what is a language model let's look into the some examples which we encounter encounter every you know uh, sort of the, our day to day activity to sort of appreciate the the notion of this language model so you know whenever you start typing on any uh, browser or search engines uh, you you see that uh, you get a suggestions for the next word or the next subsequence of words <clears throat> or phrases or if you even try to type on your messengers uh, you know trying to even type your sms or on whatsapp or that kind of uh, you know the social media platforms uh, there also you will see that immediately you start typing few words and it is you know giving you and suggesting uh, a next word or next sequence of characters next phrases and and so on and uh, the speech recognition you know all of us uh, you know uh, you know now have these different uh, you know our, our mobile phone or alexa kind of a uh, uh, you know tools where you 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 try to say something and then you see that it, it's a trying to sort of identify or convert that voice or audio to the text so there also it is actually combining the audio signals and also the, the language model uh, and then try to sort of see that what actually you have uh, spoken uh, the spelling correction where you have uh, this uh, just a moment uh yeah so the the uh, the spelling uh, corrections where you have this uh, uh, the the spellings are correct but i mean the, the word as such is correct in terms of this spelling but it's not an appropriate word so if you see these two examples you can identify that the Uh, indicates that this is not the correct uh, word should be there so instead of by it should be uh, so uh, study was conducted by students not the b students so so uh, instead of b it should be the by so given these two sentences which are the more probable um, sentence so there again you can sort of think that the language model uh, can be used similarly for the machine translations when you have a you know multiple uh, options or multiple possibilities for a uh, sentences in your target language then you can also try to sort of uh, identify that uh, where uh, <clears throat> uh, which of the, you know the, the the various possibilities of these uh, target sentences uh, would be the correct one or the most probable one so and, and th these are only some of the examples you may even think of by yourself uh, several others uh, and as the discussion progresses we will see that the language model is now uh, you know you think of the any nlp task and the language model is uh, sort of 
already there inherently it's, it's there it may not be visible to you but it's there so we will see towards the end of the lecture that whether my this claim is correct or not so essentially whatever the examples which i have shown to you what it so that our objective is to find the next probable word or to find which sentence is more likely to be true or more probable so if that is the case so now uh, the language model uh, in general we can think of that uh, a model which assigns the probabilities to a sequence of words now uh, in fact i should have corrected this the, the, the now this notion of the word is not limited to the, 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 the our general sense of the you know the words so appropriate thing would be that the assigning a probabilities to a sequence of the tokens and the tokens are coming from your some a sort of the vocabulary okay so uh, so that's the you want to do with the language and as i have already mentioned that you have uh, uh <clears throat> you know the probability of uh saying that okay whether this sequence is more probable or this sequence when when we talked about the speech uh, recognition uh, uh speech processing task and then here we have this machine translation task where we see that whether this possibility of the sentence has a more uh, prob uh, is more probable than the other one okay so in uh, when we try to sort of define it it, it more formally so Uh, how how it it, it uh, goes so <clears throat> it goes like this that the, you have a finite set of the vocabulary uh so now whether it's a you know the uh, general notion of our words or it could be a tokens where even the the part of the words could be could be you know considered as a single token and that could be a part of your vocabulary and then a set of the possible sequences over this vocabulary or words in this vocabulary or the tokens in the vocabulary in such a way that uh, so this is a sort of you know for basically for statistical n gram models it is convenient to consider that the last uh, the token in your sequence is the spatial token which is the stop that is uh, uh, you know considered So that is a traditional way to thinking, but it may not be, you know, always the case in some of the models. Uh, so now, what we want to achieve is that we want to find out a function w one to w n such that this the last word is always this is stop word, and then the rest all other can come from uh, this vocabulary in such a manner that this function should be always greater or equal zero. and if you take the summation over all let's say that the sequence uh, coming from this particular set if you take the summation over that it's going to be a one so essentially what we are saying is that this function is a probability distribution so if you are able to uh, do that so that is what is the, the the what we call is a language model so that means uh, uh, now when we talk about a language model so essentially it boils down to finding the The probability of a sequence so here is an example that if i am with recent advances in ai and that is what uh, my uh, sequence of tokens i want to sort of find out that what will be the probability of this so let's see that how i can i can uh, try to sort of you know because now this is a kind of you can say that these are the joint probability distribution over these uh, variables the random variables you need to identify. So identifying this joint probability distribution could be a very cumbersome task. We, how can we simplify? So, as you might be already aware of about the chain rule. So, if you use the chain rule, so this joint probability is reduced uh, into a product of the conditional probability. That looks uh, a bit simpler uh, compared to this one. So maybe we. just if you are able to estimate these probabilities conditional probabilities and we just take the multiplication of together that gives exactly this value so this is an exact estimation of this joint probability distribution however so now how we can do that so we can just uh, think about a very a frequency approach or it can be also so that if you try to sort of identify uh, find out this conditional probability and define it as a 
based on their frequencies. So that boils down to a <clears throat> maximum likelihood estimate, but that I'm not uh, deriving here, but I think you can, uh, most of the textbook will uh, give you the derivation. <clears throat> So now, uh, so the qu question is that, can I do this? Can I just consider uh, this uh, probability estimate, this conditional probability estimation as simply this, uh, you know, the frequency in this particular way? So what is the problem here uh, or will it be fine? So the problem is that, you know, the language as we know that it's very productive, we can keep coming up with new sentences. Uh, we can say same thing in so many, uh, different ways. So it would be highly, you know, uh, uh, it's not practically possible that you have a corpus where you have invariably all possible sentences to be presented. You cannot have the infinite corpus. So that's a, a problem. So then what will happen is that any probability which you are looking at, there is a chance that you will, uh, some of these counts either in the numerator or denominator gets zero. If it is uh, zero in the numerator, then you know uh, uh, it, it becomes uh, uh, it's, it's a zero probability. But then if it is, it is a zero you know denominator, that causes even the severe more severe problem. So, but then we don't really want to go into uh, that kind of a situation. So then, what is our uh, uh, you know solution? The solution would be that maybe we can look into this some simplifying uh, assumption and that we rely on or use this Markov assumption, uh, which says that uh, instead of considering the, all the previous context, so let me just also use certain terminology here that, uh, so when I consider, for example, when I'm uh, considering this uh, probability, joint probability distribution, so if this is my word, then, uh, uh, the, the condition on the previous words, these are what called the, con the context words. Uh, so, uh, so instead of depending all the last, the previously seen word or the previous two seen words or the previous K seen words. So that is what the Markov assumption says that this conditional probability uh, under the Markov assumption, this is the same as uh, this when uh, your probability of particular, you know, the target word is conditionally independent of all other words given the previous one. Okay, so that's the the, the Markov assumption of, of first order. Markov assumption of the second order says that probability of this variable or in this particular case, this particular token is conditionally independent of all the words given the previous two words. So that's what the, uh, the Markov assumption says. And uh, with that, we can now simplify uh, our joint probability uh, distribution uh, with the product of uh, the conditional probabilities where instead of considering the entire context, we are considering only the previous K uh, context or previous K words. And with that, uh, we have uh, different n-gram models. So the n stands for that how many previous word, uh, uh, n actually is basically that the how many total words are together here in your conditional probability definition. So if you have n minus one word, in, in your uh, on which you are conditioning, so then it's an n gram model. So as you see here, that unigram is the simplest model where you assume that each word is independent of all other words. So basically, each word uh, appearing of each word does not really depend on its context. So it will keep all the words are are uh, you know uh, going to come based on let's say that this frequency or based on this probability. The bigram model, which says that if you, you, you are going to assume that probability of appearing of the Y is dependent on the, what you have seen the last word. So, and that can be defined as the count of how many times you see these two words appearing together in your corpus. 
and how many times you have seen this particular context word in the corpus. So that's what the, the bigram, as this is a bigram because there are two words and uh, wi and wi minus one, the target word and the context word. And similarly, this trigram is here because now you are going to consider the previous two context words and the one target words altogether three words. So that is why it's called the trigram. And it's a second order Markov model. So, you know, if we, if we again try to sort of formally try to define this trigram model, so this would look like something this where, you know, we have just modified a slightly this conditional probability distribution, uh, the definition, uh, and uh, given this, uh, you know, expression. So now, uh, Yes, uh, with maximum likelihood estimate, uh, we are able to reduce our problem where we don't really have to consider the entire context because that gives us a very uh, high chance that there will be many of those probabilities zero. But then uh, the, with the Markov model or the n-gram model, uh, it has reduced to certain extent, but then it's not really completely, you know, the, uh, this problem is com not completely vanished. So there is still a chance that there would be the sequence of words uh, or, or uh, there would be some words which are not seen in, in your training data and this is appearing in your test data. So you will again fall to the same uh, problem. So, but uh, some problem is easy to solve that if there are words which is not seen, then you can do this out of vocabulary, uh, you know, you can try to handle the out of vocabulary word, uh, word in some manner. And one of the easiest thing is that, you know, you look in your corpus, you look at the, which are the less frequent words and put them together into a one single unknown category or divide them into based on certain patterns into several unknown, uh, you know, several such categories, unknown one, unknown two, unknown three, uh, and then, all of the words which follow into which fall into one of those categories will be given the same uh, the, the probability or the count uh, for all other words, you know, as in that particular category. So, out of a word vocabulary is easy to handle, but the when you have your words are present but not. In a, in, a, in a similar context, if it is not present, then there's a chance that you would going to give the probability to be zero. So that you are underestimating many of those probabilities. So, uh, so that is one issue. The other issue is that the n-gram model, because you are considering a limited uh, the context, so it will not be able to capture the long distance dependence. So for example, if you see here, uh, if I give you this, the sentence and I ask you to sort of use your language model to identify the last word. So then uh, it, it is sort of, you know, if you, as you see here, the sentence, this crash is basically uh, modify or let's say that, you know, uh, is relates to the computer instead of any other words, okay? So, but if you use the n-gram model, so if it uses, let's say that the uh, bigram model, then it will try to sort of see, you know, dependent on the floor, what could be the the next probable word. If it is a trigram model, then it will might be look into the fifth floor and then try to predict the, the next word. And then it is very like, very unlikely that the crash uh, word would be predicted. So it's not able to capture this kind of a long dependence, not able to identify that the computer is going to be sort of relevant here. Uh, so for for uh, this kind of a problem, the sparsity issues or underestimation of the probabilities, we can go back. Uh, we can again do something, and that is again uh, something called the smoothing technique. So there are uh, several uh, smoothing techniques uh, uh, was used, uh, you know, prior to this the neural models when it became famous. So add one smoothing. Then there was some generalized version of the add one smoothing. Uh, then, uh, you know, 
uh, the smoothing methods which try to sort of take the help of the lower order model. So if you are considering the bigram model, and uh, if if the corresponding counts are zero there, then you might try to look into this uh, 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 fallback to the unigram model and then see that whether uh, that can help you. So just to illustrate this idea, so if you have these two, you know, uh, the counts of this W1 and W2, these bigrams is equal to zero, okay? Uh, then what will happen is that if you use the additive smoothing, in that case, uh, the conditional probability of seeing the W2 given W1 is the same as seeing the W2 prime given W1. However, if we assume that there is a very less chance of W2 prime appearing uh, in the corpus uh, compared to W2, then what we should expect? We should expect that this probability should be more than the this probability and not the the same. So that is where the you know uh, this sort of you can say that the backing of method or the smoothing method comes to play, which says that okay if I cannot give the non-zero probability to certain uh, conditional probabilities because the corresponding counts are zero. Maybe I can look into the unigram and uh, and then based on that we can modify that probability to to to, to get non-zero probability. So that the idea that there are again several methods are there. I'm not going into details, but there are uh, linear interpolation models, discounting models, and so on. There are several such models are there, which were very popular when the neural models were not there and when this n-gram models were uh, being used. So you have to rely on one of these smoothing techniques to get a better uh, the probability estimates uh, for your uh, uh, conditional probability. Uh, so now, uh, so as we as we see that here also, uh, this uh, even if we are using two smoothing techniques, uh, we still have uh, you know uh, uh, the issues of this sparsity. Uh, it does not really resolve a lot of things. Uh, it is still considering a very a limited context because the, if you increase the, the increasing the uh, the n gram, uh, so if you if you, if you consider the unigram, of course the parameters are small because you only have to find out the unigram probability. You have to find if you go to the the bigram, then you have to find out the the estimate all the probable the bigram uh, the, the conditional bigram probability. If you go for a trigram, so it's subsequently now you can see that the, the, the number of parameters are increasing uh, slowly. Then if you go to, uh, you know, uh, four gram model, so then the, again, of course, you are increasing the context. So you, you are able to uh, get a better uh, models, likely to get a better models. However, in the uh, you know expense of you have you are increasing a lot many number of uh, parameters uh, and then uh, you know accordingly your smoothing techniques are also going to get you know uh, complicated as you increase the n graph so the with these issues the neural uh, language model probabilistic neural language model has come uh, I mean, there were several attempts, uh, but one of the prominent attempts was in 2003 by Benzios and uh, his colleagues, where uh, they try to sort of estimate this conditional probability. Okay, so remember, uh, in our definition of the language model, we wanted to find out the probabilities for uh, sequence of the tokens that has been broken down into the product of conditional probabilities. And if you take this Markov assumption, then you have these, uh, whatever the context 
uh, you think that is relevant, you, you try to uh, take a smaller context. So here also we are doing that only that we are going to estimate this you know, probabilities. However, uh, instead of using the maximum likelihood estimates, we are now estimating these probabilities with the help of neural network. So he has used one particular uh, architecture where uh, you have this, uh, you know, um, the uh, as an input you can give this one hot uh, embeddings of uh, your uh, input tokens. Uh, so these are the context words, and uh, give to this feed forward uh, the network here. Uh, take a certain natural at activation functions, and then you also at the output layer you have this entire vocabulary present here. And then you take the softmax to say that which of these words gives you the, the maximum probability and that could be the your output. So that's the way this, this uh, model has been uh, designed. And, uh, uh, and then, uh, uh, you know, so there are two advantages with this model that of course you are able to get uh, uh, this this probability is estimated much better than the, uh, what we were able to do this with the help of uh, maximum likelihood estimates and the smoothing technique. Uh, so, and another edit advantage was that you are uh, now uh, instead of working on the discrete space. So remember that we have these random variables w i w. W1, W2, WI, and so on. But here now, each of these W is in a real uh, vector space. So that becomes a continuous space. And you can uh, utilize the, uh, you know, the relation between the, the words much more efficiently. So now uh, let me explain that with the, uh, so, so what are the advantages this this model brought? First is that it has better flexibility in considering the larger context. So, although you 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 know here still you are perhaps only looking into a limited context, not the perhaps the entire uh, sentence, but still it gives you uh, more flexibility to consider the. The, the larger context instead of uh, just n equal to two or three. Okay, so that is the one advantage. And second is that it, it's uh, uh, the how it generalizes. So, for example, let me try to sort of explain with the help of uh, certain examples. So, uh, so for example, you know you have found that uh, you want to estimate this uh, probability. Uh, you know, reading given Ram if. But assume that this Ram is reading was never present in your training corpus. However, there are some other words like John, Sam, and then those things is, is, is present. Okay. So, uh, and same time, there are other sentences like Ram is writing, John is writing. So, basically, what we want to say that the context in which Ram or John is appearing, they, they is likely to appear in similar kind of an a context. So uh, their uh, the representation in, in the continuous vector space, which is being obtained uh, here, is going to be very similar, likely to be very similar uh, to each other. Okay. So, so in that case, the, the estimation of this probability, the probability of reading given Rami is going to be very, very similar to what you might have seen is uh, for the case of the probability or reading given John is because um, the, the, the context here, this is same. Uh, John has the, and the Ram is something which is very a similar kind of a representation. So that is what is being sort of put inside this model, uh, and uh, you know, so so if, if the values are very similar to each other, then this outcome of this neural model would be also very similar 
Okay, so in that sense, it is it is able to generalize much better than the statistical n-gram model. So what two things uh, this kind of a model has given compared to the statistical model? One is that it is able to represent words uh, in a continuous space rather than a discrete space. So, so if it is able to do that, then it can utilize or exploit the relation among the words. So that is the one byproduct of this neural language model. And the second is that it is it has the better ability to consider the, the, the context. So there are two things which has actually uh, brought this. And as we know that uh, once the notion of representing words in terms of these vectors, the continuous vectors, uh, you, with the help of this kind of a the neural model, uh, you know, around 2003, of course, there were some attempts and there were, uh, of course, some work along that direction, but then, you know, it became, you know, now a very common thing after, let's say that maybe around 2010 or so, uh, is obtaining a vector representation of words uh, with the help of the different types of the neural model is, is, you know, again, is one of the very common things which we see in NLP tasks uh, these days. However, there are some major drawbacks. What are those drawbacks? Uh, uh, you know, the one is the inefficiency. So what, what kind of an inefficiency? Inefficiency in terms of uh, what we see is that in the output layer, you, you have to sort of, you know, during the training time, you have to calculate this uh, for the softmax probability. You need to sort of really estimate all of these uh, probability uh, to obtain, so because this, this has to be done for the entire of the vocabulary. So this, this makes uh, this particular model uh, very inefficient because generally you have a huge vocabulary size. And that is one big problem. The next is that it is unable to exploit the sequential nature of the text. So here in the input, there is as such no way to uh, control that this word is appearing after this word and then so on. So, so that has really um, uh, not taken into account. So sequential nature is not being exploited here. Although it is able to take uh, more context than the statistical n-gram models, but still it is only considering a limited context and it's a unidirectional. That means that it's uh, only taking into account, uh, uh, you know, if you see this one, that it is only going to take into account what are the, these, the previous uh, tokens. So it is not able to take that what would be the further token. So that kind of information is not being utilized. So in that sense, it's a unidirectional. So what are the different ways to uh, handle? So these are some of the examples. By no means, these are the only ways to handle this, uh, these issues. Uh, and if you see literature, there are several ways uh, people have tried to capture, for example, inefficiency. One is the way to when you have considered this the hierarchical softmax. So with the hierarchical softmax, uh, what you can do is that instead of considering them as a uh, the entire uh, uh, vocabulary, uh, you only have to sort of estimate the probabilities for, uh, you can arrange them into a tree and then you can try to sort of only uh, focus for that at a particular position, are you going to left or right? Okay, so uh, if you can uh, able to estimate those probabilities, so then given let's say that any of the word, you can try to sort of uh, find out its uh, corresponding probability. So for example, probability of cat, given the context uh, words. So here you see that in this particular hierarchy, how you will traverse, so you will traverse that from here, you will go to the left, then you will go to the right and then again you will go to the right so that is the path you are going to take in this particular uh, tree so 
if I assume that uh, my probability estimates are uh, estimating the branch at right, so in that case, so here it is going to the left. So I have to say that the one minus branch right at one, and uh, because this would give me the probability of left branch left at one. I mean, I, it's difficult to write here. So this is basically that you know I what I wanted to say that at left. Ah, so this is just giving us me the, the, the probability of being left at one. And this is at the right and this is at the right. So this will give me the uh, probability. So this actually reduces the, the number of parameters to be really estimated. So that in that way, it, it uh, takes care of the inefficiency issue. Uh, the, the question of the limited context and the sequential nature, this has been handled by the the RNN, the recurrent neural models, or the different variants of it. So I'm not going into that, you know, different variants of RNN, but just giving you the general diagram here that now you can consider any, let's say, the variable length of input. You can consider the entire, let's say, the, the, the sequence or the entire sentence here, and you can feed into this. You have because the, because of the RNN, let's say that the general properties, which I think you are already aware of, the share of the parameters and so on. Uh, so, uh, so it, first of all, it reduces the number of parameters. It allows you to consider the sequential nature. It, it allows to give consider the you know uh, because it gives you the uh, sharing of the parameters. Uh, increasing the length of the input does not really changes the number of parameters. So that is why uh, now this the issue of this limited context being taken care of. The sequential nature is considered because the RNN uh, by design takes into the sequential uh, properties. So in that way, you you try to sort of consider uh, RNN as it's, uh, as a language model. And here also you go one by one. So first when you Go with your first word, uh, then try to predict the next word, and then corresponding loss to calculate. Uh, then again, you uh, go to the next word. So this next word now have the previous context available to it, and again try to predict the next word, and then corresponding loss would be calculated here. So you just take the summation of all the loss to get a, a total loss while you are training your uh, recurrent neural model. So the, but the important point to remember here is that with RNN, you are able to take care of this limited context problem as well as the sequential nature can be also now exploited. Uh, however, at this particular time, uh, you know, uh, what we see is, so we, we understand that, okay, inefficiency can be taken care of. We, Say that the sequential nature can be taken care of, limited context can be taken care of, but it's again still unidirectional that it only goes from left to right. Uh, so take care of this uh, 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 method is the ELMO has come uh, in, uh, as I you know uh, said earlier also that. Now, many of these models are giving you two things. One is that the, the, it gives you the language model as well as the some sort of the word vector, uh, the word embeddings can be also obtained. Uh, what is, what does the ELMO does? It, it consider again the different the variant of RNN called LSTM. And I think you must be already familiar with if you are attending all the lectures in this particular workshop. So this LSTM, with the help of LSTM, so it takes the one side, it has this forward LSTM, and another side, it has a backward LSTM. And then it uh, uh, takes the, you know, uh, the loss is, or, or when while training, it combines the loss uh, together of, of both the forward and the backward LSTM. And, and according to uh, accordingly, it, it actually thinks. So let's look how does it look like. So you have this forward language model, which is also uh, called as a left to right context 
applying this model because you are going from left to right. Uh, so it's basically this probability is being estimated like this. Uh, the backward uh, LM, is, which, is, which we call is a right to left context. So this is what you are doing. And your training objective is you to maximize the joint likelihood of both the forward language model as well as the backward language model. And here, while this these parameters are separate, corresponding to its uh, the you know whether it's the backward or the forward, but this parameter, the theta i, which corresponds to the uh, the input embedding layer, so that is being shared. So that is also you can see in the this diagram, and the theta s, which is basically the the last softmax layer, that is also being uh, shared in in the two uh, backward and the uh, forward. The only thing which differs is uh, the parameter corresponding to uh, the forward LSTM here and the backward LSTM. So these two are different, but however, these things are being shared. Okay. Uh, and then it is that is what the, the, the joint likelihood of this is being sort of optimized to, to obtain this one. So in that way, you can say it tries to take both the context, the forward as well as the backward context into account while defining this one. Uh, so what we have seen until now is the RNN model compared to the feed forward model is uh, take, it is able to take the larger context it is also able to exploit the sequential nature of the data. The text data the, is inherently uh, sequential. So there is a dependency involved. So, so that is being sort of taken into account by RNN, by its design only. Uh, uh, however, uh, it is it has the problem, it has another you know, problem with the vanilla sort of the, uh, you know, RNN model, uh, it, it does not take into account the, the bidirectionality. It's still unidirectional model, but, uh, but this ELMO somehow is able to take care of this bidirectionality by considering the two separate uh, language models, the forward and backward, and training uh, them together. So that's the way it is able to do that. So that's why we say that it is, some sense it is able to consider the bidirectionality, but it's a limited, and uh, and it's it's a difficult to uh, parallelize. So these are the you know the the challenge with the RNN based model. This is uh, in general uh, the second part is in general true for whatever application you uh, try to use RNN for. So this issue is always there. <clears throat> So, <clears throat> so then uh, we have uh, after this uh, we have this uh, this large scale uh, pre-trained neural language model. So that era has come uh, based on the once this transformer uh, uh, model has come uh, to take care of some of this this advantage of uh, the RNN model. So again, I'm not going to be, uh, you know, describing what is transformer. I again assume that you know about it. And if you don't know about it, maybe my suggestion would be that if you read relevant chapters from the Jurovsky book, it should be very, very clear to you. Uh, so uh, by the way, that is anyway, I think it's a very good uh, textbook. You can say if anybody wants to work in NLP, my suggestion would be that uh, start keeping as a textbook or a ref book and slowly start reading from this book, all the chapters. And the good part is this is available right now uh, freely. Okay, so uh, the vanilla transformer language model is, uh, you have this transformer block and uh, it, it, it almost goes very uh, you know, similar to what we have seen in case of uh, the 
what we have seen in case of the RNN model. Now let's see that how the different variant has come to take care of some of the issues which we have uh, discussed uh, here. Okay. So, uh, I mean, uh, the broadly we can divide uh, these uh, some of these pre-trained uh, the language models into three categories: the autoregressive language model, uh, masked language models, and the encoder-decoder language model. So the autoregressive, in fact, until now, whatever the language model we have discussed, starting from the statistical n-gram models to uh, feed-forward models to uh, RNN models, so all fall into this autoregressive language model. And you, as you see that uh, you know, subsequent slide, again, when they have written certain expressions, so that gives an idea. Then we have this masked language models uh, and encoder-decoder language. So let's look quickly to, to uh, these uh, uh, language uh, models. So autoregressive language model uh, is basically, it takes this uh, transformer architecture. So this architecture is basically the transformer architecture. And uh, the transformer art architecture, but only the decoder part. So decoder part is, it means that where you are trying to generate uh, a sequence of tokens. So that is what the decoder is. And uh, so it, you will give certain, let's say that certain representation to indicate that you have to start generating the sequence and then it will start generating sequence. So it will first generate the first symbol, then that again goes back to this one. So then you have these two contexts and then you try to generate this one and so on. That is what the uh, decoder generally means. And, and you can feed that decoder in any kind of an architecture, RNN, uh, uh, transformer, and so on. So, so this is the transformer architecture. So what objective is that? Predicting what word comes next given the previous word. And the, the, you can assume this word as a loose sense of the word in the sense that it could be a word, it could be a sub word. So we have these tokens here, basically. Uh, so here, our objective is to maximize the log likelihood based on the previous uh, i minus one context and generate the xi. So this is auto regressive because what, what are my random variables here, xi's, and this depends on its own, uh, you know, the instances appearing in the previous time point. Okay, so that is why it's called the auto regressive. It is able to regress over itself on the previous whatever we have observed, okay? So that is why it's called auto regressive. So this is my context. This is my the target token which I want to predict. And this theta t is my transformer decoder parameter, okay? So you have the transformer architecture with the different layers of the self-attention, fit forward layers, normalization layers, and so on. So all of these, would you know, all of these together will come into this set of the parameters. Uh, so, you know, you can see that what are the uh, points about this autoregressive language model. So the advantage is that, of course, it is able to take care of the sequential nature into account. However, uh, it's still a unidirectional. It's unidirectional. Uh, that is a negative point. Uh, and what the positive point is that it is able to take care of the sequential nature. And by virtue of, let's say that, you know, transformer, so it has certain added advantage over RNN architecture. So that anyway would be there. So that I have not mentioned here. And the way it is sort of being trained is it's going for, you know, the if you're the downstream the task is about the generation of the natural languages. So there, uh, this could be more uh, useful. So the examples you might have heard of these different architectures, GPT, GPT-2-3. So it's uh, the underlying idea remains very similar, whether it's a GPT or the subsequent version of GPT. Uh, the, uh, no, some, uh, 
changes are at the level of let's say that what corpus is being used and some sort of a fine tuning for the downstream task how it should be done so that variation you know you know uh, distinguishes uh, earlier version to the subsequent versions of the gpt now so, but this is a you auto regressive uh, language model then we have the mask language model all of us might have heard a lot about you know the bird and and so on uh, robert and uh, there are several variants of it so what it is is that it is trying to implicitly take care of this bidirectional context so how does it do it is given a sequence it is trying to sort of correct the input uh, sequence by masking either some part of your the sequence tokens and uh, then try to predict those masked tokens so here you have this b d is has been masked and that has been put as an input and then it is trying to sort of predict this b and d okay so it's predicting the mask words given other words in the sequence so here uh, uh, you have very similar kind of a you log likelihood but if you see here we want to predict the target token xi given now you, you can consider the entire sequence and that means it's not only dependent on the previous token it is going to consider all of the tokens okay uh, of the of the sequence except that itself and this mi is just a kind of an indicator variable you can say it is one or zero whether xi is masked or not if it is not masked then we are not going to really predict that word so that will be coming to the loss but if it is masked then only this will be one and then you are going to consider this uh, and this theta t is the, again your transformer and this is the encoder one means that you know you give a, your input and try to obtain a kind of a single representation or a representation towards the or, or, uh, higher layers so that is just trying to encode whatever present in the sequence <clears throat> it is not trying to generate uh, any uh, sequence of uh, words as compared to this auto regressive or decoder part of the transformer okay uh so now uh, what are the you know uh, what are the advantages of this fast uh, language model so it is inherently bidirectional uh, it is non auto regressive and that means that specifically during the inference time you can parallelize and make the inference uh, time very small uh, however uh, there are certain downside of uh, this is that it is uh, it is making an independent assumption so what is what it means if you look into this uh, loss function it is assuming that whatever the mass uh, words are there they are sort of you know independently appear okay so they they their dependency between these mass words is not been taken into account and that creates a problem okay so that is one issue and the second is that you know when you try to use uh, this language model for a uh, different downstream task so there uh, you won't have any mask you know input sequence so your pretending objective of masking certain words and then predicting that versus the fine tuning task uh, or the target task where there is nothing is called as a mask Uh, sequence so then uh, there's this this kind of a discrepancy is there and that may not be very optimal uh, to be used for uh, such kind of uh, the downstream task however people have found that it is a this kind of a you know the language model can be still uh, fine tuned for several uh, classification tasks uh, quite good so now uh, you know we quickly let me go through this the encoder decoder model so it it actually has a both encoder part and uh, as part of the pre training objective uh, it it can use several uh, way to corrupt the sequence and then in the decoder part they try to predict the original sequence that is what this encoder decoder model does okay and these are the some of the examples which uh, are have done that way 
And you can see that the, the log likelihood, which says that it is trying to predict this sequence, the y1 to yn. And given that you have this corrupted sequence x1 to x. So it did not be decent, uh, you know, the, the, the length of this should be the, be the same. Uh, so that is why it is different variables here given. And this theta t includes the, the entire the model parameters for the encoder and decoder part of the transformer. Uh, <clears throat> so it is bidirectional. Uh, as well as you know, uh, it has also certain uh, properties of this auto regressive by virtue of the decoder model, uh, and of course it is also able to take advantage of the bidirectionality by virtue of this bidirectional encoder model, and its uh, added advantage is that the you know as you have designed this architecture. It is good for sequence to sequence learning tasks. Like, you know, the sequence to sequence means that you have, as an input, you have something as a text, and then the output also you have a text, something like a machine translation. So that you give a one sentence in a source language, and then you want to get a sentence in your target language. So you, you have put input as a text, and your output is also a text. So the sequence and output is also a, a sequence. Summarization, you have given a, a bit longer a chunk of uh, text, and then you want to summarize that. So that is another uh, sequence. And that is what, uh, so these are the examples of sequence to sequence learning. So this kind of an encoder decoder language model is more stable or easy to con uh, you know, uh, fine tune for such kind of a task. And you know, uh, based on you know, the different models might try to use or design the different pre-training objectives. Uh, so, for example, this example uh, in this particular case, what I we have shown is uh, kind of a rotated document. Means that you have uh, you know flipped the way of the sequence these, these words are appearing. So, there the books will stop, and then this students open is gone into after that. So, this is a kind of a corrupted one way to corrupt uh, um, a sequence. And you can do the masking as here shown. So that is another way to corrupt the sequence and so on. So there could be several uh, such ways to, to, to corrupt the sequence and then uh, train in this encoder and decoder uh, architecture. So uh, apart from which are these different pre-training objectives and the, the different uh, architecture, what are the other aspects which actually matters? Uh, so the size of the corpus on which these models are pre-trained, the quality, uh, how much, let's say, that the pre-processing and the clean data set it has, where is the source? Uh, so if it is, for example, you know, coming from uh, news articles, so often those are well-written, uh, uh, grammatically correct sentences, compared if it is coming from, let's say, that some uh, random, let's say, that the web, pages or it is coming from social media platform. So then the quality would be a bit uh, worse than if you have only this uh, the corpus of news articles. So the quality matters, the diversity, how different kind of, you know, the, 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 the text uh, zona has been sort of considered uh, in creating this corpus. And uh, what is the domain of the intended downstream, downstream task? So this thing should be clear. So for example, here I have taken this uh, table from this particular paper, uh, which indicates that different, you know, very commonly used models and what kind of a the source they have considered. And also you can see that the size of it. So you can see uh, someone is considering only about uh, 13 dB data, but then Roberta and all, they are considering 161 GB data. So that's a sort of a humongous, let's say that amount of data. And then, you know, uh, uh, this, then it, it leaves in terms of even number of tokens, and that makes perhaps more sense. And you can see that slowly is going to sort of increasing uh, the, the number of uh, tokens. And the model size, you can say in terms of the, the parameters is also uh, increasing uh, Subsequently, 
Then you have also this uh, some some of these models have been adapted for the multilingual purpose for different uh, uh, you know for different languages, and these are the multilingual models. Uh, for specific domains, so for example, for science, you have all, all the science articles in computer science and biomedicine. That is cyber. BioBert is for the biomedical publications and so on. So there are these specific language models where the corpus is being taken, you know, in a such a way that you can exploit the nuances of those particular kind of a text or the language. These are the pre-trained language model on the different languages. It does not include the Indic word, which is defined for the Indian languages. Uh, then, uh, you know, these models are also fine-tuned based on the, you know, the, what is your target task. Because see, this is another paradigm shift which I wanted to highlight. Uh, instead of going into details, I will try to summarize that. Uh, so these pre-trained models are trying to sort of capture the very generic nuances of our language. And irrespective of, let's say that whatever NLP task you want to work with, you have to have capture the language understanding, isn't it? So uh, if there is a model which actually already have this captured the, the, the language essence, then you can directly try to sort of focus more on the target task. You don't have to uh, train your model to understand the language. Okay, so this is where it is. It has become very generic compared to what we see in statistical and gram models. It is only able to capture uh, and only limited to give to only those probability distributions and nothing else. And it becomes very difficult to just to use that uh, for any other task. Okay, on the other hand, this. Uh, kind of a pre-trained large, uh, you know, the pre-trained uh, language model is actually gives you much more flexibility. And depending on what kind of a, uh, the data which, you, which is in your hand, you can actually decide different uh, fine-tuning strategy. So, for example, uh, this one uh, is where you have um, you know it's your transform uh, you know your, your pre-trained language model and your target task and you try to sort of fine tune this whole uh, architecture or you uh, you only uh, try to fine tune the some part of this architecture so maybe few top layers of uh, this transformer uh, architecture or the you know, the language model architecture uh, coupled with this your uh, specific, let's say that uh, classification or whatever the task you are at your hand, corresponding to that uh, layer, uh, you want to fine tune as well as some of the top layers of, of your pre-trained language model. That is a partial fine tuning or you can do the entire one, depending on the how large you have this, your label data. Uh, but in a way, you are not changing any architecture here. But you can also, in the, this particular case, you can also have the custom model. So that means that you can change uh, the, the these architectures at the top, and you know, and then again, either you fine tune only this part, or you fine tune this custom model parameters as well as your transformer or the pre-trained language model architecture. So those, uh, depending on that, what data you have, you, you are uh, trying to fine tune. And then uh, there's another one where instead of trying to fine tune everything uh, of your pre-trained language model, you just add certain component to these uh, transformer model and change these parameters only along with, I mean, this is these are projects. So your pre-trained language model, the transformer part of this parameters are frozen. But from this transformer, there is something attached to this, some sort of a simple feed forward network kind of thing. And that parameters is being adapted. 
and then you can also fine tune your uh, the, the the head part or the custom model part so these are the different paradigms people try to do depending on what is depending on what is the target task as well as how much the data is available to them so now just try to summarize and finish it in one minute uh, is we have started from the statistical model the statistical model essentially moved the language from a uh, language model from the rule or the grammar based model which were earlier there which we have not discussed but it was uh, earlier there and then it has moved to the data driven model but in general it is able to do just one task of is estimating those probabilities then you have this probabilistic neural models uh, early generation neural models where you have uh, try to increase the context try to improve the general uh, ge you know generalization performance of those models as well as you have said that okay instead of considering the discrete space of words you consider the the continuous words in a continuous vector space okay so this is another paradigm and then these word embeddings can then be sort of given for any particular task in different architecture neural architecture uh the transformer based pre trained language models uh has given this idea of the contextual embedding which is slightly better than having this kind of a global embedding that is means that one representation for a word in all possible contexts whereas this contextual embedding is that for every context it is going to give it's a different representation and it is much more generalized in the sense that now you can apply this kind of an architectures for more downstream stuff so in that way this this sort of you know uh, this paradigm has uh, the language model paradigm has sort of changed uh that comes to the end of my uh, talk and if you want to look into the any of the you know uh, references i think uh, the minimal references if you ask me i think these two references should be good enough to to for you to uh, understand whatever i have talked about in this particular lecture okay so thank you again and now i'm open for questions in the talk thank you asis sir for your wonderful talk so participants if you have any questions you may ask you or you may raise your hand i think there's some question yeah maybe in the chat box they have posted sir so there's a one question is uh, where can we use uh, parts of uh, speech tagging and how can we use in nlp i have not understood this question very clearly uh, so the part of speech problem uh, where can we use part of speech tagging uh, so you mean uh, that the, uh, you if you have already available information about the part of speech that's what you mean or you want to add find out for a given text what would be the part of speech oh yes but <laughs> uh you want to find out the part of speech baskar uh, or you want to use part of speech so if you want to use part of speech then if you have the part of speech you can consider that uh, you know for each part of speech you can think of that again it has some embedding representation and that can go in corresponding to uh, you know you can concatenate that with your uh, for example the input embedding of words so that could uh, generally that is uh, the way people use uh, that in a part of speech uh, and uh, how can we use in nlp i mean if you have a part of the speech information and your task demands that that it, it can be useful information you can always put as an uh, uh, embedding alongside the the word uh, embedding so that is the one question then uh, i hope that has answered to the master question and then second one is <clears throat> could you please provide some quick insights on using encoder decoder models for text to text generation uh 
So I think uh, if you saying that the input and output are the same kind of text, so do you mean that it's a paraphrasing? Uh, if that is the question, it, I mean, uh, it can be used in, in that way only, you know, uh, math problem. Math problem, I honestly, I don't know. Uh, because, uh, you know, what kind of a math problem you are saying, you are saying that the simple addition kind of a thing, whether it is able to understand the rules of addition, whether that, or if you give this uh, complex problem. Uh, uh, I think it should be able to do that given enough number of uh, training examples. Uh, my intuition says that it should be able to do that. I think you really don't have to change anything, except that you may have to have a, you know, uh, for uh, the way how do you do this digit representations that might matter. But okay, reference slide uh, you want to see. So this is the reference slide. So these are the reference slides. Yeah, for, uh, of course, the natural language problems, I think it should not be a problem, but maths problem, I am not sure. Uh, uh, you have to be a bit careful in the deciding about the input embeddings corresponding to the different expressions and all. So perhaps the contextual embeddings may not really require there. Okay, if there's any other questions. No, then I think. Okay, so once again, I would like to thank you for accepting 